The assorted beasts of Monster Hunter don't just come in a single form, but rather exhibit a vast array of differences that can range from simple changes in pigment to outright speciation. Mutations, environmental changes, and hunters can also bring about differences on an individual level that can potentially have some population impact too. So let's explore the breadth of variation in the Monster Hunter world through its subspecies, rare species, variants, and deviants. First off, a huge thanks to Big Al for sponsoring this video. Using the Zora Magdaros tier patron that I didn't actually think anyone would go for, they requested that the alternate forms of monsters be made into a video, and thus kicked off this round of broader topics in Monster Hunter. Their generosity in supporting the channel and patience in this video's creation can't be stressed enough, so hopefully this video delivers. So what is a subspecies? Subspecies is a taxonomic rank below species that indicates a genetic or morphological variation within the species, but one that can still successfully breed and have fertile offspring with others. Many subspecies in the world are identified by different colour morphs, and often share significant habitat and range overlap with the type species too. This is seemingly the case in some of the bird wyverns, as some of the bird wyvern subspecies have complete range overlaps with their type species and can even be seen together, such as blue and pink kutku and normal and purple gypsaros. In these cases, there's likely a lot of interbreeding, with little adaptive or environmental significance, with the more common normal type species just being the more dominant morph in the offspring. Some others, like Karupako, are exceptions, with comparatively little overlap with its crimson cousin outside the deserted island. The possible adaptive significance of crimson Karupako's more vibrant plumage to reduce infection may mean that they select for similarly vibrant individuals where possible and limit interbreeding. And it could be that crimson individuals in the deserted islands are vagrants rather than residents too. Coral Puki Puki may be in a similar boat, and is separated from the regular species by the harsh wild spire waste, resulting in little genetic mixing between the two. The difference in element is primarily environmental, as it's derived from diet rather than anything the body itself produces, and so there isn't sufficient poisonous flora for coral pukey to consume to achieve this, hence the use of just water instead. Whilst all types of pukey presumably use their feathers for communication too, the difference between coral and normal may be for camouflage in their respective environments, green for the forests and brighter colours for the coral highlands. Some species are also typified by a complete lack of pigment. White monobloss is one such example, and its white coloration extending to the horns as well as the scales seem to show a complete lack of pigment, with only the beak seeming to retain some colour, and this may be from feeding as well. This is comparable to leucism, which is a lack of pigment seen in many animals. This subspecies is rarer than its base species, and as well as being recessive, it may well be that colour has some importance in monobloss courtship, with both the frill and horns, with white individuals being less successful. Ivory Lagiacris are another example, with there being some effect on behaviour, in that whilst an Ivory Lagiacris physically is otherwise near identical to a normal Lagiacris, they spend a lot more time on land, and as suggested prior, this may be due to better land-based hunting thanks to their colour. That one morphotype seemingly preferentially spends more time in one environment than another may help reinforce the subspecies even when overall habitats overlap heavily. Kezu is another example, with some suggesting that red kezu are the type species, and whites either albino or leucistic individuals that have lost all pigment from a life underground. Either way, despite near-total overlaps in habitat preference, kezu species may have little admixture due to their possible parthenogenesis, which is to say breeding without mating. If this is the most frequent method of reproduction, then kezu as a whole may only have occasional mixing at random. Such unique breeding biology may maintain subspecies in other ways too. Rathian are fiercely territorial and don't permit other females in their home range. Only a few get to pair bond with the Rathalos, and the higher quality territories that come with it, so Rathian that get this privilege will have a better life, in an easier territory, and no doubt raise healthier offspring, much better poised to seize their own territory. They may also inherit their mother's territory, 
even displacing her once she enters senescence. This intergenerational privilege is very real in the animal kingdom, and can have significant positive effects on those who wield it. The acquisition of a good territory or nest is effectively being born with a silver spoon in your mouth, so over time distinct bloodlines of wraths may rule certain territories for centuries at a time. The oldest Jaya Falcon nests have been used continuously for well over 2,000 years, and Rathian nest sites may see similar stretches of use. Prime nest spots like the giant tree in the ancient forest and the cave in the forest and hills may well have been used for similar stretches of time. So Wyvern society favours these privileged individuals, and so certain species or subspecies may prevail in areas for multiple generations, allowing for a relatively close proximity of blue or pink, red or green, or even gold or silver individuals, with comparatively little admixture. The fact that such individuals prefer to bond with each other rather than mixing seems to suggest that mate choice plays a role in keeping these subspecies relatively distinct as well. Such ancient lineages may only relinquish their grasp of prime territories naturally in rare landmark events, like pandemic frenzy outbreaks or curio swarms, or unnaturally if slain by a hunter. It's unknown if wraths will mate outside their usual subspecies brackets if there are no other options available, or if mate choice is incredibly strict. It could be that there's some flexibility if there's no other options. And some guild members also seem to doubt whether different colour wraths are a true subspecies at all. Some subspecies are brought on by diet, and that technically makes them variants, but we'll put a pin in that for now. Both of the crab subspecies are apparently brought on by diet, and diet impacting pigment expression resulting in different colours is seen in the animal kingdom. A lot of the time this is due to carotenoid pigments, that don't just appear as different colours, but also help with an animal's immune functioning and cellular protection. Carotenoids are often the most frequently used pigments in displays for this reason, and often showcase foraging ability. Melanin is another important and common pigment assisting in camouflage and photo protection. Plum Damio and Stone Fist's much darker coloration could well mean it's a well-melanated individual from diet allowing it to spend more time above ground in the desert sun and forage better in turn. It's something of a snowballing series of benefits. So the subspecies may be healthier animals in better condition, and thus are harder to take down, hence a higher quest rank. Unlike the Terra Shogun, who is presumably loaded up on pigments, Rust Razor's deviant status appears to be solely from its shell choice affecting its claw sharpness, and otherwise it's a fairly normal Cyanator, if a large one. The ore-eating wyverns, chiefly Gravios in its juvenile form Basarios and Yoragan, can also sometimes have dietary changes causing physical anomalies, especially the sequestering of crystals on the body. It's unknown exactly how Ruby Basarios comes about, but presumably some of the substances in the ground it eats are processed and excreted as gemstone. If it's actual ruby, then it may come from Basarios feeding in an area rich in aluminium, Aluminium is non-toxic, but it isn't utilised by any living thing on our Earth, and maybe that's true of many monsters in Monster Hunter. The aluminium may be filtered out and excreted as gemstone, due to impurities with it in the Basarios diet. Ruby is created from the base corundum by chromium, as is sapphire from equivalent impurities, so hypothetically with the right diet, a sapphire Basarios could easily emerge too. It's unknown why Ruby Basarios don't grow into Ruby Gravios, but maybe the huge mass of Gravios means any excretions are too thinly spread to form proper gemstones, or perhaps the more Durophagus adult form can actually digest aluminium, or perhaps all Ruby individuals are just hunted before that age in an example of unnatural selection. For Uragon, though, they have a definite use. Uragon have little sexual dimorphism outside the breeding season, when bulls ornament themselves with ores and crystals to impress mates. Steel Yorigan is an individual with an unusual diet resulting in its unusual appearance, one that's presumably more attractive to mates if brighter colours and greater shines are what's desired. And the steel remark may reflect their presumably harder scales with this new diet. This is then taken to its extreme with crystal beard individuals, who, like Ruby Basarios, have secreted gemstones into their mandible presumably making it the most attractive Uragon of all to females. 
It's mentioned stronger materials with a high luster are preferred, and if the gemstones can withstand Yorgon's chin pounding, then they pass the test. It seems Yorgon bulls make their bodies billboards of their territory quality and health, and thus steel Yorgon may be rare, and crystal beard rarer still, due to the fact that these top bulls will jealously guard their patches from other males, whom they'll also likely be superior to. Territory reshuffles likely only occur with their death, when a new bull can take over, and presumably become a steel or crystal beard Yorgon itself. Environment in general plays a strong role in the evolution of animals, and some subspecies can often seem adapted for areas that seem the polar opposite to their natural home. A good deal of mountain monsters can have desert subspecies, like Baryoth and Baroth, and the distribution of some other monsters like Tigrex may help suggest an answer. For one, such areas can often have similar selective pressures. With snow replacing rainfall, mountains can often be arid areas themselves too, and deserts can often be at high altitude as well, and cold at night at any rate. Many desert animals have adaptations for heat, cold, high altitudes, drought, and low amounts of food. The latter four are often common points across the two ecosystems, so mountain monsters may well be able to fare reasonably well in a desert environment. The question of how they got there could come back to the Ice Age theory. At one point in the planet's history, it likely underwent an ice age with lowered sea levels and huge changes in rainfall, vegetation, and habitat. Mountain monsters may have been much more common in lowland areas, and were once very widespread, before being cut off into more isolated pockets when such periods ended. Sand Baryoth and Copper Blangonga, among others, may have become marooned in the arid subcontinent, and adapted accordingly with their hides becoming more camouflaged to the sandy and rocky terrain, as well as possible physiological changes internally too. Adaptations to suit one environment, facilitating the colonization of another, can be seen in the New World too, and especially in Glavinus. The bulls especially are well adapted to volcanic fumes and other toxic substances in the Elder's Recess, filtering and excreting them from the body via either the tail or the bursa, and this puts them in good stead to adapt to the effluvium-infested rotten veil. Becoming marooned in the veil, they partially speciated into acidic glavinus, a genetically isolated and distinct subspecies adapted even further to deal with the effluvium. More generalist species with cosmopolitan distributions across the globe can tend to show little speciation, Tigrex shares a complete range overlap with Blangonga and Baryoth, and even further across the land masses, but only seems to show any speciation in volcanic areas with brute Tigrex. This is taken even further with nomadic species like Devil Joe and Basil Juice, who both have continent-wide ranges with a single population. As such, some monsters have variations on an individual level, rather than a population one and become known as variants. Variants is a broad term, with little unifying it other than the fact such individuals are different, and can have multiple different impacts for assorted species. There are some parallels though, and some variations are simply a monster at certain points in its life. Ruina Nergiganti doesn't get much information outside of calling it a veteran of many battles, so it could be taken that Ruina is simply an older, larger, and more experienced Nergigante. And this may be the case for a few more as well. Emerald Congolala apparently start as regular Congolalas, and shed their pink fur for green once they reach a certain point in their lives. It's possible this isn't the case with every Congolala, and only the subspecies have this later development, but any Congolala seen could hypothetically become an emerald with age, similar to how the silverback in gorillas is a similar recognisable sign of maturity. Rusted Kushala Deora also haven't received much explanation in-game, but Kushala's ecology video suggests it's just as simple as a rusted individual is one on the cusp of molting. Any possible claims of its increased belligerence may just come from it feeling on edge due to the vulnerability straight after shedding its skin, as well as the looseness and brittleness of its normally strong armour. The guild are apparently aware that not all of their classifications are accurate, Black Diablos are often called a subspecies, when they're a seasonal variant as the cows enter a must-like state in the breeding period. It seems the guild still refer to them as subspecies to try and stress the even greater danger they pose. So maybe some hunters don't really buy that variants are really all that dangerous. 
despite the fact some variants are perhaps the biggest threats to civilizations, and the Savage Devil Joe is one of them. Savage Devil Joe are a deleterious mutation that causes the animal to be permanently enraged. Their huge size suggests this presumably only occurs after the animal is fully developed, and possibly even around senescence. This variant may be more powerful, but it has no potential benefits for its species, and its frequency within a population may remark on the overall health of the species. Giganox also have a similar dead end in the Baleful Giganox. Also described as a mutation, albeit a rare one, their eggs seem to be infertile compared to the normally super fecund regular Giganox. This presumably prevents the frequency of more baleful individuals, and their possible failure to reproduce may be the reason for their comparative rarity. Some variants are also at least partially made by external factors too. Furious Rajang, Scarred Yangaruga, and Scorned Magnamalo are all wounded individuals. For Magnamalo, this was already an exceptional individual with longer arm blades and more hellfire, but for Yangaruga and Rajang, the injury is the sole difference. So these could potentially also be classed as deviants. The deviants are an odd bunch and definitely seem to have some overlap with variants. Some are unique individuals caused by random events, whereas others seem replicable in a population. Elderfrost Gamoth is apparently just an old female Gamoth, whereas Red Helms are just large, aggressive Azuros with oddly coloured fur. They're mentioned as a Red Helm over the Red Helm. This may also be the case for a lot of other deviants like Snow Baron Lagombi, Drill Tusk Tetsukabra, and the Wraths too. In animals, there's a behaviour known as terminal investment, when adults and typically males approaching or in senescence double down on assorted behaviours to try and get a final boost of reproductive output. In some species, this can often manifest as riskier behaviours, or even increased aggression or territoriality, and so it may fit that a lot of deviants and variants could be older specimens, or can be interpreted as such through their increased size and large or damaged ornaments. Terminal investment can also cause territory shifts too, with male loons relocating to less productive areas they guard fiercely to try and recoup some success. This could be an alternate explanation for individuals like Seething Basil Juice and Abyssal Lagiacrus. If they're both older individuals, it could explain the odd change in territory. Seething stops being a nomad, and sticks to the recess to try and get a head start on the other males by cementing itself in the area believed to be the Basil Juice breeding ground. Abyssal may be pushed out of prime coastal areas by fitter, younger males despite its greater size and has to use poorer quality foraging areas in deeper water and with fewer potential mates as it enters senescence. Some deviants are just that though, and are truly unique individuals shaped by specific incidents in their lives, rather than environment or genetics. Both Deadeye and Scarred Yangaruga have a similar past of being pursued by hunters, only to seemingly successfully turn the tables on their attackers, multiple times in the case of Deadeye. Garuga are intelligent wyverns and seem to harbour some memory that humans are bad news for them, and so the most dangerous individuals are the ones made by people. Diablos are also no strangers to becoming even more hostile in response to past trauma. In Freedom Unite, there was the one-horned demon king, an immensely powerful Diablos wounded by other hunters, and then there's the most well-known of them all, Bloodbath. Much the same, Bloodbath was also wounded earlier in life, and the horn has grown back partially deformed. Bloodbath is famously aggressive, and has crushed almost all who try to hunt it, but the danger may not just come from aggression. Bloodbath is very large for a Diablos, and discoloured too, not being fully black, but rather permanently black-tinged. From this, it could be possible Bloodbath has an ovarian tumour, causing its extreme morphology. Diablos cows already undergo prolonged seasonal spikes in androgens in their breeding periods, when they become black Diablos in a period similar to muffs in elephants, and women with such tumours can produce over three times the normal amount of androgens. A Diablos cow with a similar ailment could be put into a state of permanent pseudomuffs that may cause enhanced growth, aggression, and the discoloration. Tumours on the adrenal system can also cause similar effects, as can issues in that part of the body too. 
Female animals with defective adrenal systems can overproduce hormones like testosterone and start exhibiting male behaviours and significant aggression too. A surplus of some androgens like testosterone may also explain the horn and bloodbath cement's power too. Testosterone improves bone health, strength and recovery at average levels, and extreme levels of it may cause abnormal growth like bloodbath's deformed horn. Its above-average bone density may also allow it to commit such extreme moves with comparatively little damage to itself as well, only making it more dangerous. An alternative explanation could also be gynadromorphism, or intersexuality, that bloodbath has both male and female characteristics. This is a lot harder to conclude, as outside the breeding period, diablos bulls and cows are effectively impossible to tell apart. There don't seem to be any exclusively male diablos traits. But gynandromorphic animals possess both female and male traits that lead to some striking individuals, and it could be one possible interpretation of Bloodbath's unusual coloration. Some other deviants could be possible examples of this too. Hellblade Glavinus has one horn significantly larger than the other, and could arguably said to be darker and more drab than the regular species. Gynandromorphism can occasionally occur with one side of the body corresponding to one sex, and this could be one explanation for the lopsided appearance of Hellblade's horns. Subspecies, conservation-wise, can often be a cause for concern, and some can be in tenuous positions with their long-term future. Could subspecies, variants, and deviants have broader implications for their relationships with humans? Well, luckily for Monster Hunter, this may not be the case. Many true subspecies seem every bit as common as the type species, and there's no reason to really conserve colour morphs compared to any other monster. In the case of variants and deviants, it could also be argued that such individuals should be hunted for various reasons. Savage Devil Joe is literally a terminal case anyway, but possesses huge danger to all around it with no real benefit benefits to its own kind. Similarly, raging brachidios may also be detrimental to the broader species. Its mentioned altricial brachidios juveniles are occasionally killed when in contact with the adult slime moulds, and this weeds out weaker animals and presumably partitions the young. The far more reactive flashpoint slime that raging individuals carry may well be too much for any juvenile to handle, and severely limit population recruitment and offspring survival when they're present. In trophy species, such specimens are often the most ethical target for trophy hunters, as they've passed their reproductive prime and tend to have minimal contribution to a population. Combined with their potential danger, deviants and variants could be an opportunity for the guild to actually live up to their claims of harmonious hunting. Finally, regarding subspecies, they're best identified genetically, and at the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st, Numerous charismatic, widespread megafauna underwent significant subspecies culls, as many were found to be moot and solely based on insignificant morphological changes, usually put in place by early taxonomists that were removed with the cold facts of genetic sequencing. Without such technology at hand, it's no surprise a lot of Monster Hunter subspecies almost certainly aren't actual subspecies. And with much of Monster Hunter's fauna, we wouldn't really expect such either. Small animals often speciate to varying levels easily, as natural barriers are much more prevalent in restricting their movements, and thus cutting populations off, or causing adaptations to new areas. Larger species will have larger ranges and be much more mobile. For the giant, wide-ranging and often volant fauna of the Monster Hunter world, there's going to be a lot of genetic mixing with their huge ranges, if they're still extant by the time the Monster Hunter world develops such technology, we could expect to see a similar reduction in official subspecies. To the surprise of no one, I do have some thoughts on the assorted flavours of monsters from the games, and I've never been especially interested in subspecies, and that hasn't really changed with time. Second gens were alright, actually having new moves and model changes too, which was really nice. And I'd say Iceborne's maybe the best of any generation, but that's not really saying much considering most of the others are either simple palette swaps like first gens, or just generally awful like most of third gens or sunbreaks, that either don't make a lot of sense, aren't especially good changes, add another fire monster, try to steal another monster's niche, or all four. I'm not entirely adverse to more of them, but I would like more thought put in, and ultimately I do find myself preferring variants which go especially well with the more dramatic monsters, 
and just double down on what their key traits are for an even more bombastic fight. Iceborne Savage Joe, Seething Basil, and Frostfang Baryoth are perhaps the best examples of this to date, and I really found all of Iceborne's variants fine to excellent, being one of the few seemingly able to tolerate Shrieking Legiana. From a lore perspective too, I also prefer the variants providing a deeper dive to the understanding of the original monster, and fleshing them out more. Over Oluk they make fire and are a different colour. But then I also do admit this is probably best reserved for monsters apex level or higher. Fight-wise, a lot of lower tier monsters don't feel like they have enough firepower to really double down on fight-wise. And on top of this, I also just feel not every monster needs an alternate form. To this day, I thank the gods we haven't got Dragonblade or Tango Ice Blast Seregios. If he does get anything, I hope it's just a variant. And then we have the Deviants, which I'm probably the most bipolar on in that I feel they have the highest potential and yet the middest execution thus far. The notion of an individual monster being changed is a nice idea, but isn't executed especially well. There's the saying, the more you add, the more you take away, and the Deviants generally suffer from this, typically getting just very extra additions like explosions or constant poison, or massive earth shock moves that either come out of nowhere or over-exaggerate a monster's abilities rather than complementing them, as variants typically do. It's just over-the-top escalation, and if you haven't already, go watch Herney's great video on why this gets old pretty quickly, and can even be detrimental to gameplay in the long term. But the idea behind Deviance is excellent, and has incredible potential for Monster Hunter and its story. In big game hunting, it's generally regarded that a wounded animal is the most dangerous one, and even unassuming antelope can kill people when wounded and backed into a corner. So maybe deviance shouldn't be about flashy, superpowered escalation, but rather taking something away from a monster to change its moveset. Crippling a limb, damaging a sensory organ, making it unable to produce an element, or just generally utilise its main gimmick make a monster a threat in both the lore and gameplay by preventing its ability to function normally, and maybe even have it be the player's fault. Some monsters like Bloodbath and Scorned and Scarred dabble with the notion that hunters can change a monster, but this is only present in text and has little bearing on gameplay or the story. I think it'd be a great touch for the hunter to have multiple encounters with a game's flagship, and through them turn it into a deviant by wounding it in one such fight getting in on the idea that the most dangerous animal is a wounded one, and thus their actions have put everyone else at risk. I also think in lighter terms, individual mutations could provide nice little bonuses on expeditions or general exploration. A bit like Red Dead Redemption's legendary animals, having a randomly generated Diablos with unique horns, or another monster with unique patterning, then maybe an extra move or two to go with it, and then the option to have the head or skin in your home, would be a nice little thing to keep things interesting, although that may suit open world more. But what do I know? Thanks for watching. And once again, a huge thanks to Big Al for sponsoring the video, and also to top patron Venomenon for their long-term generosity supporting the channel too, as well as Kay Sandom, Erengar Steini, Sassy Birdo, Evilly, Howleth, Archzor Queen, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their continuing kindness in keeping the channel going. As ever, the positive comments on the Jurassic World video were appreciated. I've no plans for more videos on the Jurassic series in general, nor to really watch 65, but I did feel the same at the end of the first Jurassic video, and yet the most recent one was still made, so who knows. Thanks to all who submitted questions too, and especially to those who somehow managed to slog through the whole tier list and Q&A. For this video too, I should add a complete step-by-step run-through of every variation would have got repetitive fast, and led to a very long but not especially thorough video. So I tried to group them by theme as best I could, with some key individuals getting a bigger focus than others, and some subspecies and variants have either such bare lore, or such outlandish changes, that it's generally hard to say very much on them. Similarly, some that have already been discussed in depth before, or relatively recently, weren't as heavily focused on here as I didn't want to repeat myself too much. But it did give a good opportunity to improve some cut material or ideas I only had after making past videos. And speaking of, the next video will be on Monster Ecosystem Services, which will hopefully be more interesting than that just sounded.